The 3DS and the Wii U's online have officially shut down, and without various chunks of their functionality, these consoles feel less whole, less complete. Fan-driven alternatives do exist and are amazing, but things just won't ever be quite the same as they once were, which is surreal to think about and kind of upsetting. Are you f***ing weeping yet? This is horrible. I remember being obsessed with these things back in high school, even though I never even had a Wii U, and I really wanted a Wii U. I wanted it so bad, like, at least this much. The last few weeks of Wii U discourse on Twitter X X is what prompted me to want to talk about this, and I started thinking about everything that has led up to Nintendo's current position, about influence, unseen influence that's often forgotten. Stuff that reflects both positively and negatively on this console, but I'll get to that. Theoretically, 13 million Wii U's exist in this world, and that is not a big number. This theory implies there was no mass exodus event. It's just agreed upon that it sucked, like an unspoken rule, even if you've never touched the damn thing. And that's okay, you don't have to own a console to have an opinion on it. You don't, you don't need to be an expert. Everyone is entitled to their own viewpoint. I just feel it's different when you call a console's library sparse or call a controller clunky if you haven't bothered looking into context or meaningfully interacted with either one. Also, I am not saying it's a perfect peak device. I am not ignoring the 50 bajillion dollar revenue loss, so don't put words in my mouth. However, the Wii U was so important to the success of the Switch, and I want to go over why I think that. Marketing. You know exactly what we're about to get into. Hey, you. Do you like kids? I, I mean, are you a squid? No, I, I mean, are you a well-adjusted family of middle-class citizens? Mondo bussin fam, please buy our console. We have Google Kaga Chronicles and also Splatoon. There was a massive focus on babies, or if it wasn't babies, it was toddlers. If it wasn't aggressive advertising to children, it was boring and or bad advertising to young adults slash families. Children will always be a target demographic for Nintendo, but they just can't be the sole focus. It's very alienating. Unless they're trying to sell a baby game like Bayonetta, that, that I get. Most Wii U advertisements simply weren't appealing or didn't communicate the hook well or they treated the audience like nincompoops. It made the device seem like a toy. Whether it was a European, American or Japanese ad, they absolutely failed in this department. Sure, a few of these ads do have some personality with their cheesiness and are certainly more memorable, but no, it'd be f***ing lunacy if these ever came back in full force. Even the DS wasn't this corny. They were trying anything in this era, and that had mixed results. Nintendo decided to cut that sh out and focus when the Switch era rolled around, probably noticing how beloved cheesy Disney Channel commercials were among casuals and fans alike. Just look at the sales. The change in how they attempt to woo non-Nintendo fans shows you just how much the Wii U changed this company's thought process. Their marketing just shifted so dramatically. Hell, who knows if the Switch would even exist if the Wii U succeeded. Also, the Switch is just inherently a pretty neat idea. I feel like it would be harder to f*** this concept up when trying to get people to buy it. Look no further than the original reveal, where it's paced well, doesn't have an obnoxious level of audio thrown at you, shows off what the console can do in a short amount of time, utilises actors above the age of five, basically the opposite. Then on the other end of the spectrum, there's Smash Bros. Smash 4 hype was ludicrous. If you know, you know. If you were there, you know. The Wii U console's marketing is easily the worst stuff Nintendo ever did, besides advertising Earthbound but smearing shit all over people's Nintendo Power magazines. However, the videos they made for Directs and especially Smash Bros were legitimately just on a whole other level. Entertaining, engaging, these ads compelled you to want to excruciatingly transform into a hairy ape on the bus. People focus on the crappy stuff, as they should, but these classic Smash Bros reveals we grew to expect in Nintendo Directs, that started here and extended itself into the Switch era. Mega Man, Lil Mac, Duck Hunt, such high quality nuggets of hype, well, Mega Man's trailer single-handedly convinced me to actually play his games. Everyone Is Here was a monstrous thing of its own, but the opening cross, Smash Card, that emphasis on being cinematic and grand, 
folding the original game's art style into the reveal, treating character reveals as events and not just DLC, and finally, upholding Smash as not just a celebration of Nintendo, but gaming in general. Really, that all began with Smash for Wii U and 3DS, and its marketing. Then you have the Bayonetta trailer. There were better choreographed machinimas than this. In 2009. My point is, Nintendo went from this one extreme to balancing their message with mostly safe ads that don't overload you on personality but also have a little charm of their own. It shows they learned valuable lessons from the Wii U era to the extent that I don't think a future Nintendo console will ever make a mistake like this again. I like to call that funny impact. But also there were simply things they did in this era that stuck around, both in a literal sense and in a metaphorical sense. Comedy adds a lot to the memorability and charm of an advert and I don't think it would hurt Nintendo to sprinkle a bit of that back in every now and then. Wii U games for Switch. I know people are sick of this being repeated, but the Switch regurgitated Wii U titles like it was nobody's business. I don't have a problem with that. It makes sense to turn all that development time for games very few people played and spread okay. it out to a bigger audience, as well as use it to fill a gap in your schedule. Nintendo did do this quite a lot though, and to the extent that it did make the Switch's library a little bit less impressive when you zoomed out. But Mario Kart 8 on launch was so so important, so crucial to the success of Switch. Creating a brand new game takes time, resources, people, time. You can't simply will it into existence. And sitting right there, they had this polished, great experience with tidbits of DLC begging for an ultimate edition and transformed that into a better looking game that plays like a dream in your pocket. Also, it's for Mario Kart. In 2017, you couldn't get that anywhere else. Nintendo then repeated the same joke over and over again because everyone knows the Wii U didn't exist. Oh, shiny brand new video game, says the consumer. If new, then only Deluxe. Mario Kart 8 Deluxe has since become the most popular Switch game of all time. You, sh you could make the argument it's the biggest Mario game in general. It seemingly has an attach rate of like 40% and while well, that's no doubt partially due to being a pack-in, it's also because the game is essential to many. Yeah, and that is a premier Wii U title. Mario Kart 8 in its current form today is different than how it ended on Wii U, so it'd be kind of f***ing ridiculous for me to say this is merely a Wii U port, but these DLC tracks only started life two years ago, while 8 has remained the basis for all of it. And on top of all that, do you people remember what the Switch launched? with. Breath of the Wild was revealed in 2014, had a small showcase later that year, reappeared in 2016, and won E3 by existing. It was consistently brought up as a reason to buy a Wii U and even sold a few million on there. Zelda Wii U. This was the Wii U's Zelda, making it all the more hilarious that it's a Switch essential and all anyone needed to invest in the console in its first month. 2017 had Pokemon Tournament, Zelda, Mario Kart. Technically Lego C. 2018 had Bayonetta 2, Donkey Kong, Captain Toad, Hyrule Warriors. 2019 had a new Super Mario Bros U and Yoshi's Woolly World, but worse. 2020 had Wonderful 101, again, technically, as well as Tokyo Mirage and Pikmin 3 Deluxe. Old games were consistently used to fill the Switch's calendar up until at least early 2021 with 3D World, which is admittedly the last Nintendo published Wii U game that came to the platform, and it is one hell of a package deal. So yeah, it's, it's not as if that's all the Switch has had to offer, but that is still a solid four years of re-releases. It really did heavily rely upon the implication that these were essentially new games to most people. Four years is also how long the Wii U was alive, so that at least it came full circle? Oh, that doesn't even include other remakes slash remasters. The Switch was kind of a port machine for a while there. I do appreciate Nintendo occasionally going the extra mile for some of these ports, emphasis on occasion but at the end of the day, you are still looking at Wii U titles. Moreover, three of the Switch's 10 best sellers are Wii U games. Because the Wii U was backwards compatible and because it was Nintendo's first HD console, they couldn't exactly be like, hey, here's 20 Wii games that run better and have some more features as the one time they did do that, everyone collectively went, 
Okay? Visually, there is so much less needed taking a Wii U game to Switch than there is taking any prior generation to Wii U, so they couldn't rely on ports. This obviously resulted in game droughts and wow, 70 year old games. Having to go through all that with the Wii U basically set the Switch up for success when it came to consistent releases. Wii U games on. Switch. Now the Wii 2 was home to a few unique games that didn't get straight remasters. Games that practically justified the Wii U's existence to many. Instead, Nintendo clamoured to make versions of these games for Switch, and the Wii U fanbase was not thrilled. First, f***ing Splatoon. Splatoon is one of Nintendo's biggest franchises today, alongside Zelda, Mario, Pokemon. It sits right alongside the big boys. A fresh, new type of game that was unlike any other shooter that saw life on the Wii U in 2015. No other new Nintendo IP in the past 20 years has grown in popularity like Splatoon has, as, unless you count me slash Wii's as that, which yet yeah, technically it would count, but it undermines my point so it could go straight to hell. Nine years later, you have this massive fan base that's engrossed themselves in Splatoon and its lore, a series that's only grown since inception. But it's easier to parrot shareholder quotes, so I'll just do that. Splatoon 1 was a massive win for Nintendo, selling 5 million to the 13 million consoles out there in the wild and making the company more relevant in the gaming space amidst Nintendo's struggle years. Splatoon 2 and 3 have collectively sold like 24 million smackaroonies and obviously both games wouldn't exist without Splatoon 1. Splatoon 2 was also largely built off the original game, you can immediately tell that from a glance. A sequel would not have come as quickly as it did without reusing those assets. And if they didn't, boom! A major Switch exclusive from the console's first year disappears just like that. Hell. Look at Smash Ultimate. I personally, I enjoy looking at Smash Ultimate. It brought so many iconic characters together and is ultimately the best Smash game. Someone out there believes 64 is the best Smash game? The argument for slavery grows stronger every day. To say that Nintendo Switch was boosted by Ultimate is an understatement. Flash Mothers was f***ing everywhere in 2018. It was the game that told me I need a Switch. A new Smash game less than two years after the release of the console was an out of the ordinary, but it's more that Smash 4 only wrapped up in 2016. No one anticipated that quick of a turnaround. It was just unprecedented at the time. I wasn't sure if Ultimate was a new game or a port when it was first revealed, and obviously I was not the only one to share this sentiment. Clearly Clearly the answer turned out to be yeah, no? Now Ultimate is noticeably a different game, it's not a clone, even Splatoon 2 isn't a clone, but again, you can tell assets, maps, movesets were all largely reused. However, the game was, according to this guy, built from the ground up, when visibly I don't no, that that's the case, which they probably don't literally mean from scratch, but saying it was built from the ground up does make it sound like they reused nothing. I mean, you look at Melee, to Brawl, to 4, and these all have very different feels. You look at 4 to Ultimate, the flowers are different colour. Now I kid, I joke. Perhaps I even jest, but never before has a sequel felt like this much of an extension of the last title. From the art style, to the way it feels to hit each other, to the maps, to the whatever you can think of, a Smash 4 is this game's skeleton, to the extent that people consider 4 to be a worse ultimate. However, the sensation of Smash Ultimate wouldn't have happened without 4. It is so vital to Ultimate's existence. And of course, you can apply everything I just said to Mario Maker 2 as well. Take everything here, make it bigger, polish it, add more features, a single player campaign, you make damn sure to add worse controls. Do this thing, but do it. Better. They did that song and dance three times on the Switch. Why play X when you have X, but better? I would understand if some Nintendo fans felt like they'd been slapped in the face. Whether it's through a reuse of assets or pods, they took most of what made the Wii U stand out and just recycled it. Now thank goodness they did, for the record, I'm not saying they shouldn't have released games for a console and that they should have left these games alone out of respect. I just dislike when people don't give this console the credit it deserves. If it wasn't for all the work Nintendo put in with the Wii U, who knows if the Switch would be as successful as it is today. But it's not just 
the software that's left its impact. For example, look at the gamepad. It's a switch if it couldn't switch, and you forget how similar the two devices look until they're side by side. Especially when you hold them in your hands, the switch really does feel as if it was cut from the same cloth. Being this tablet built into a game controller, it is what many thought the Wii U gamepad would be, unrestricted. Down to the exact same screen size, 6.2 inches. Resolution wise, Switch is 240p better, but the gamepad is surprisingly crisp for what it is, particularly for when it released. Both had their own kickstand, both have Joy-Cons, uh, that is if a Wiimote and Nunchuck count as Joy-Cons, which they do because I said so. Yeah, now I've got to mention the Switch's design has DNA of not only the Wii U, but also the Wii and other Nintendo consoles. It would be wrong to stay here, the Wii U was the sole influence towards how the Switch turned out, which, you know, that's just, that's not true. That is part of what makes the Switch so good. Many things moulded the end product. However, if these are father and son, the intercourse worked. Nintendo took note of what they did with the Wii U gamepad when making the new console, like the foundation to something better. Something evolved. About what worked, what didn't, it was something they could iterate and improve on. After all, they had the experience and technology is always progressing. Like utilizing USB-C. And not the Planet Fitness f***ing 48 kilogram charging brick. But that's why I say this console had insane impact. There was a definite pressure on the Switch to succeed. They forced them to get their shit together. It forced them to put their entire whole foot forward after they already put their second best foot forward like three years prior. The pieces gradually came together to create the Switch and the Switch's library. Oh, and I almost forgot about Amiibo. Amiibo, Amiibo, Amiibo. I'll admit this is less of a Wii U thing and more of a Nintendo thing, but it's still big on life in the Wii U era, hitting its peak of popularity in 2014 2015. And if you watch the commercials and early Amiibo marketing, they do mainly feature the Wii U when they're showing and using the damn things. Hell, the concept of Amiibo was revealed in an investor's meeting, but this damn image of Mario being scammed into the damn gamepad. So it just feels like Amiibo would have less of a reason to exist initially if the gamepad didn't have NFC built into it. The Toys to Life fad was more of a home console thing. 3 out of 6 3DS consoles straight up couldn't natively read Amiibo, only new models could, and on the release of Amiibo, new 3DS consoles hadn't left Japan yet. Even then, that's a whole ass upgrade. Add on the lack of a dedicated attachment till late 2015, the lack of, I don't know, Amiibo tap, and you have a weak argument, but you just play along, man. Either way, Amiibo came to rise in the Wii U era and stuck around to this day because it was cool. I think everyone's glad it happened. And lastly, Miiverse and the user interface was so good, it made this shit look soullessly pathetic by comparison. Well, that's all fine and dandy. Stone Cold Miracle slash Gay Cold Miracle, but these were all the successes of Nintendo and the Switch, not the Wii U. The Wii U still sucked. It was still bad. Stop trying to defend it, loser. First of all, why are you being so mean? Second of all, okay, yeah, okay, it is only natural for what came before to change the here and now, and that is how influence works. I would understand if this all came across as a massive cope, but what happened here is more than just a successor replacing its predecessor and offering its own suite of features. It was much more direct than that. There's the passage of time, and then there's your best-selling title being an old game. Breath of the Wild was a Wii U game. It was. You can't deny that. And it got tons of people salivating to buy a Switch in 2017, establishing the console as a place for more core gaming experiences on launch day and showing that they value the mature audience just as much as the younger audience, just as much as the general audience. I wanted to make this argument because the successes that Wii U did have are kind of overlooked. At the end of the day, 
it was still a complete failure, and marketing was simply not the only reason it crumbled apart like that. The story of the Wii U is one of constant undercutting. It was undercut by the 3DS, it was undercut by the Switch, the genuinely great controller was undercut by the mediocre battery life and inconsistent technology, the games were undercut by the marketing, the games were undercut by the games. It was curled monkey paw after curled monkey paw. However, the Wii U directly resulted in both the Switch's existence and output being that much more amazing. Nintendo had to pull out every stop to bring every eye onto Switch to show people why they need one of these. They went all in, they were super aggressive, and that aggressiveness rarely stopped. Everything that happened in the Wii U era led up to this, good or bad. Great games, but also a relative unpopularity. Because of that, the Switch era was the first Nintendo generation for quite a lot of people, and even the first generation for people who came back after quite some time. As well as arguably the best Nintendo generation, and now, where you're discussing whether or not Switch will take the throne. <sighs> I f***ing love trillion dollar corporations.